Thank you, Anton and Ricky, for leading us in worship today. Well, so here we are at the end of another year. Not just the end of a year, the end of an entire decade. On Tuesday night, when the clock strikes midnight, depending on the time zone, the whole world will roll into the year 2020. Now, that's hard to wrap your mind around, at least it is for me. And even as we sit here this morning, uh, thousands and thousands of people are already making the trek to Times Square in New York City. Right? Does anyone know when that tradition of celebration in Times Square started? In case you could ask on Jeopardy. 1907. Okay. But thousands of people are heading there. And by Tuesday night, somewhere around a million people will be crammed into a couple of city blocks in New York City to celebrate the coming of the new year. Now that looks like fun, doesn't it? Check that out. Has anybody ever been there for that celebration? Is it fun? I'll, I'll just take your word for it. So a million people will stand there for hours just to see that famous ball drop starting at 11.59. Now, in addition to the ball at the stroke of midnight, some 30 million pieces of confetti will be released and dropped on all those people. Fun, right? Fun. But here's the not-so-fun part. To enjoy that event in person, evidently, so to get a spot where you can actually see the ball as it drops, you have to get there early, like 9 or 10 hours early. And guess how many public restrooms there are in Times Square? <laughs> how many porta johns would you bring in for a million people? You know, would you bring in maybe a thousand? That'd be a thousand people per porta john. That's a long line. Would you bring in a hundred? That's that's one porta john for every ten thousand people. Nope. Here's how many. Zero. There are no porta johns in Times Square. There are no public restrooms available in Times Square. But they do sell adult diapers. They do. $20 for a pack of 17. That might get you through most of the evening. There's also no food vendors there. The only way you can get food is by buying a table at a restaurant like Applebee's for $350 for that evening. And then you can use the bathroom too, I would assume. Now, it's estimated that about 100 million of us Americans will watch part of that event on Tuesday evening. How many of you are going to watch at least part of the New Year's Eve celebration? Right? Um, it al they also estimate that 22% of us will be asleep by the time the ball drops. And I calculate that I have a 90% chance of being one of those 22% <laughs> asleep by 11 o'clock. Here's the question. Why do we celebrate New Year's Eve at all? Why do we celebrate the coming of the new year? Anthropologists have believed no matter, that no matter what calendar human beings have followed throughout history, no matter what civilization, people have done this for like 4,000 years. They can find evidence. I saw an article in Psych Psychology Today magazine a couple years ago where the guy suggested that human beings have celebrated the coming of a new year for two main reasons throughout history. First is survival. <laughs> We're still here. You know, we got that going for us, so I suppose there's something to be said for just sheer survival. But secondly, hope. Hope for good fortune in the year to come. Now, that makes a kind of sense to me, in a way, because there are lots of hopeful things happening around the world, things that we probably should talk about more and celebrate more. For example, extreme poverty in the world is in the decline. Uh, diseases like malaria and polio are largely under control. We've made progress against the global drinking water crisis. We've made progress in the issue of making the world safer, more accessible for people with special needs. And our church, we've been a part of some of that as Chapel Street Church. But on the other hand, there's plenty of evidence to tell us that things really aren't getting better. Did you see the story it came out a couple of weeks ago out of Philadelphia? This just, it kind of cracked me up. But uh, a fight broke out in a movie theater. <laughs> a fist fight broke out in the movie theater where they were showing Mr. Rogers' neighborhood movie. <laughs> and the more you think about that, the funnier it is and the more depressing it is all at the same time because things aren't getting better necess necessarily with human nature. I always say human nature hasn't changed much in 5,000 years. But human beings still seem hardwired for hope. But the second question today is, how does our faith as Christians, as followers of Jesus, impact, shape the way we think about a new year? And this week and next, we're doing kind of a little mini-series of messages, just two messages, from one passage in the New Testament. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. In Corinth. And let me read these verses to you, and then we'll go back to the part we're looking at today. Chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we're going to take this text in two parts. Today, we are made new in Christ. And next weekend, we are made ambassadors for Christ. First, we are made new. We're made new. A few weeks ago, I think it was right before Thanksgiving, um, my wife and I went to a movie with a couple of our, our sons. And I went to the ticket window and asked for four tickets to whatever movie we we're going to see. And just as I had taken my credit card out and put it in a little machine, my wife pipes up from right behind me and says, hey, hey, check and see if they have a senior discount. <laughs> and in that moment, I had a couple thoughts. One of them was, well, I already have the, my card in the machine. And secondly, you know, there's no way she's going to believe I qualify. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to be funny. But... I mean, I'm going to take up my license and tell, show her that I'm actually 63 years old to qualify. But in that, in that moment where I'm thinking those things, in that split second, this young woman, who was about like 20, she didn't look at me. She looked at my wife, and she, she kind of winked and went, yeah, I got it. She already had given me the discount. <laughs> now, some of us in our family thought that was really funny. <laughs> Just another reminder that, right, I'm getting older, and, and so are you, by the way, so don't laugh so hard. <laughs> And yet, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And now Paul describes being made new in three ways. First, he says we are in Christ. In Christ. What does that little phrase mean? He uses it many, many times in the New Testament. In Christ. Paul explains a little further in Galatians chapter 3. He says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Colossians 3 he says it this way. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now what's all that mean? My wife uh, recently um, took a two-week trip to Southeast Asia, uh, where she grew up. Her growing up years were in uh, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. She took her 90-year-old dad with her, who, spent, who was born in Malaysia. Uh, just a great trip. But she didn't get there on her own, right? That's a long swim. She took a jet, pl uh, took a jet airplane. Uh, so in a sense, you could say she was in plane, because the plane did for her what she could not do on her own. In Christ, for Paul, means that by faith... In the death and resurrection of Jesus, by faith in the power of his blood to cover our sins, by faith we are found in Christ. No longer separated from God, but brought near in Christ. By faith we are, not, we are placed into his righteousness, no longer covered by our own sins, but covered by his goodness and righteousness. By faith we are baptized into his death and resurrection, which means our lives now and forever are hidden in him. That's what he means. We're in Christ. Therefore, he says, the old has passed away. The old has passed away. A couple of years ago, in the middle of the build-up to Christmas time, uh, I was at home, and one of my boys came home from work. He was wearing one of my old sweaters. And that's always kind of cool to see that your clothes are cool enough that your kids will actually wear them. So I said, hey, nice sweater. He goes, that was old. It was an ugly sweater day at work today. <laughs> so I thought to myself, part of, me, part of me thought, well, you know, I wait. If I hang on to that sweater long enough, buddy, it's going to be cool again. It'll come back into style like the rest of my clothes. Or I thought to myself, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time I toss out that old sweater. Paul says here in Ephesians 4, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So he's saying that because we are in Christ by faith, what he calls our old selves, that is the, 
our old desires, our old way of thinking, our old way of living and behaving needs to be thrown out because something new has come. The new has come. The old has passed away. He says, behold, the new has come. How many of you at Christmas time gave and received clothing for gifts? Anybody? A lot of people. Our boys are older now. We don't do toys so much anymore, but a lot of times it's clothes. Uh, I got some cool new socks for my boys. Um, but clothing can be kind of a risky adventure if you're buying clothes for a loved one. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about because you can pick out something that your, your loved one doesn't like very much. And you can kind of tell by the facial expression and the vocalization when the box is open. Oh, oh, nice, thank you. Sometimes you buy the wrong size. If you buy the wrong size, you can send an unintentional, unintended message. You think I'm a large? Stuff like that. Or you can do what I did a couple years ago. Went Christmas shopping for my wife. Went to her fav- one of her favorite stores. Just looking for what, you know, whatever <laughs> would look like it would work. And I saw this great looking outfit. I thought, that's perfect. I could just see her in it. So I bought it, put it in a couple boxes, got home, wrapped it up, put it under the tree, felt proud of myself. Christmas morning comes, she opens it, and she seemed, you know, she seemed uh, pleased enough. So I thought, good, uh, that worked. And then um, when Christmas was all done that day, after breakfast and all that, she said, hey, come here for a second. So she took me upstairs into the closet and showed me the exact same outfit (laughs) that I had given her the previous Christmas. (laughs) I knew it looked good. I did that. I actually did that. She kind of reminded me that the point of giving clothes is to give something new. Uh, (laughs) Paul says the old is gone, the new has come. New what? That's the question. New what? What does faith in Christ give us that's new? Now, for some of you, this is review, and that's okay, but this is critically important that we understand. By faith in Christ, we receive first a new heart. A new heart. The world's first heart transplant surgery took place in 1967 in South Africa. That patient lived 18 days. But today in America, some 2,300 heart transplant surgeries are conducted each year. Survival rate now, uh, past one year, is 88%. And the cost of a single heart transplant surgery is $1.4 million on average. But spiritual heart surgery, spiritual heart transplants have been around a lot longer than that. Way back in the prophet Ezekiel, a couple thousand years ago, God said, I will give you a new heart. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And Paul tells us how that happens in Colossians chapter 2 when he writes, When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You have a new heart because once you were dead, but God made you alive. How? What was his technology? How did he do the surgery? It says it right there. He forgave us all our sins. I want to put, I put that word in red because I want you to see this tiny little word all. It's important. Because I think sometimes in our minds, we kind of rewrite this scripture verse. We kind of rewrite it into, you know, we, we read Uh, He forgave all our sins. But what we think is, he forgave most of my sins. You know, all of them except for for maybe that one. Except for the one that I really can't forgive myself for. And we sort of hold on to that one. And we do that because we struggle to understand the nature of forgiveness. We struggle to understand the nature and power of grace itself. Paul's saying that Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we could be kind of forgiven. He didn't go to the cross so that we could be mostly forgiven. He says he forgave all. We are completely forgiven because that's the only way to have a new heart. And and there are two results to a new heart. First, we are free from shame and fear. And secondly, we can afford, we have the resources to forgive others. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I got an email a few weeks ago from a young woman I know through Chapel Street who is struggling with this issue of forgiveness because some horrific things have happened to her in her young life. Here's part of what she wrote to me. I know that forgiveness is something we should do regardless of whether or not the other person is sorry. I know that Jesus died for all of our sins 
even the ones we aren't or weren't sorry for. I also know, in a sense, forgiveness is to liberate us so we are not chained down by anger or resentment. But in practice, I guess I don't quite understand how it works. I'm encouraging her because she's on the right path. That's, that's the direction to be thinking because it works by grace. He forgave all as a gift. Therefore, we have the resources and can begin to forgive others. So we, we receive, first of all, a new heart. Secondly, by faith in Christ, we receive new identity. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Now, our culture today is, abs- uh, is consumed with this issue of identity. We hear about it all the time. The gospel of our culture is find your identity, determine your own identity, look deep inside yourself and find out who you really are, and then be who you are. The problem is, how do we know what that is? Is it what we feel? Is it what our culture tells us we are? Is it what our friends tell us we are? Is it how we dress? Is it how we act? How do I know what my true self is? Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. He writes, The Spirit you receive, that's the Holy Spirit, it comes to us by faith. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The Bible tells us that by faith, when we put our trust in Christ, we are born again, or born anew. We receive it more than that. We receive a new heart and a new identity. That is, we are children of God. We are adopted by God. That is, our identity is no longer anchored in what we feel. It's not anchored in what we do. It's, not, it's only anchored in who loves us and who chooses us to be his own. And so when we rely on culture to tell us who we are, we are slaves. And when we rely on our our friends to tell us who we are, we are slaves. And when we rely on our feelings to tell us who we are, we are also slaves. But Paul says when we allow Jesus, the one who created us, who died for us, who loves us, who chose us to tell us who we are, We are sons and daughters, he says. We receive a new identity. Thirdly, by faith in Christ, we receive new purpose. New purpose. uh, As Paige said earlier, we've been around Chapel Street for the last month. We've been raising money for Serve the World to give a gift outside of our walls. The the, the partner we chose this year was Stephen's Home in Ukraine. Um, We set a goal of raising $60,000, and I'm like many of you, I'm just sort of dying to find out where the number comes out. I don't have a final number for you. But I can give you a little hint. I do know that between last Sunday and Tuesday night when we had those, all those Christmas Eve services, we hit $60,000 just in those three days. And I know that through the rest of December, we've at least doubled that number. And counting today, we might even triple that number. But we'll tell you next week. So come back next week. We'll tell you what that final number is. But that home today exists because a young woman named Elise West started it. And some 10 years or so ago, uh, she felt simply called by God to do something for these young men with special needs who were abandoned by their culture, abandoned by their families, and she decided to do something about it. She received a new purpose. Listen to how Paul describes this purpose in Ephesians 2. He says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Listen to this. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Which means that before you even knew anything about Jesus, before you knew anything about God's love for you, before you knew anything about a new heart, a new identity, (coughs) he had in mind for you a purpose. He had a purpose in mind for your life. And that's why here at Chapel Street we're constantly inviting you, challenging you to serve somewhere. Might be in Shepherd's Heart Pantry, might be in Buddy Break, might be in a local ministry partner, might be in one of our own ministries. Because Scripture says that in Christ, we receive not only new hearts and a new identity, but a new purpose. And finally, fourthly, we receive by faith a new destiny. A new destiny. Christmas was 
fun. We had, here at church, it was fun. We had 13 services over three days on three campuses. A little over 5,000 people attended all the services. Just great fun. It was great fun at home. We had all four of our boys in and out through that time, through that week. Uh, one brought his wife, one brought a girlfriend. My, my, my father was with us. Just a great time at home. But right in the middle of that month of all the celebrations, I was asked to do, in fact, honored to do two funerals for Chapel Street folks who passed away. And then you might think, that's a pretty sad and depressing thing to do in the middle of Christmas season, funerals. But I would tell you, it wasn't sad and depressing. Sad, yes, but not depressing. Here's why. Both of those people were long, ha- had long ago put their faith in Jesus and lived out for many, many years, new heart, new, new identity, new purpose, and they knew about their destiny. So while there was grief, and there was, there was also this deep sense of this unquenchable hope that filled that room. Listen to what Peter says about this hope. 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth, new heart, new identity, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So here's why the gospel matters. New birth and living hope. If I could summarize the whole thing down to two phrases, it would be new birth and living hope. I started by saying that human beings throughout the history, throughout history have, been, have seemed to be hardwired to hope. That's why we celebrate New Year's. We hope. Some people hope in resolutions, you know, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to eat healthier. I'm going to exercise more. And those resolutions don't change much in our culture year by year. They're always about the same. Some hope for world peace. Some hope for a better economy. Some hope for a cure for cancer. Those are all good things. Some hope just in hope itself, right? But what about us? What about the church? What about those of us who call ourselves Christians? Where is our hope? What do we hope in? Paul says, we are made new. You have been made new. New heart, new identity, new purpose, new destiny. Peter says, we have a living hope. An inheritance that will never go away. Therefore, we are to live out that living hope by being more of what we already are. Let me say that again. That's a little bit of a tongue twister. We are to live out this living hope by being more of what we already are. Listen how Paul describes this in Philippians chapter 3, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. He writes, not that I have already obtained this. For I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, the old is gone, and straining forward to what lies ahead, new heart, new identity, new purpose, new destiny, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I love this paragraph because it's honest. He says, I'm not there yet. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. I'm not there yet, he says. I'm so glad he says that because I'm not there yet either. I'm on the way. My guess is you are too. You're not there yet, not fully formed. You're on the way. It's challenging. He says straining, pressing on. It takes effort and concentration and discipline to grow. The images of a runner straining for the finish line of a race. It's also simple and clear. He says forgetting what's behind. You know what I think Paul is forgetting? All the things he built his identity on up before meeting Jesus. His education, his family, his position, his power. He said all of it worthless compared to my identity found in Christ. He's also forgetting the sins of his past, his failures, and there were many, because he knows that they were all, all forgiven. And he says, I press on, forgetting I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, what's that mean? I think it means to become what Jesus has already made him to be. To become what Jesus has already made me to be, what he's already made you to be. Because Paul knew Jesus had something more for him. And I think as we stand at the end of a year, 2019, look ahead at the next year. None of us can see what's coming ahead. We can't. But I do know this. Jesus has more for you. 
He's got more for me. He's got more for us, his church. A few years ago, my younger brother, Joe, who's a pastor in Ohio, uh, decided that he wanted to do an Ironman triathlon with his son, Jeremy. Now, my brother was turning 50 at the time. He's now 60, but he was, he, and his son was in his late 20s, so they wanted to do this big thing together. You know, an Ironman triathlon is like swimming 2.4 miles in open water. I think it was swimming across the Ohio River or something. Then it's a 112 mi- mi- a mile bike ride. And then after that, it's a 26.2 mile marathon that you run. It's all one race. I think he was going through some sort of midlife crisis or something, some <laughs> temporary insanity. But they spend a whole year training to get ready for this thing, bucket list event. And on the night before the event, he said there was a banquet. It was in Louisville, I think. And there was a big banquet for all the people participating. And they did all these honors, like the youngest person in the, in the race, the oldest, the one who had done the most triathlons, the fastest time, the world champion, and so forth. But he said what really stood out to him was the guy they honored for being the oldest participant. He said it was like a 77-year-old man who had done like 50 triathlons in his life. And my brother said he just kept thinking, 77 years old, how do you do a triathlon at that age? It must take him forever, he's thinking. Well, the race comes, and the, he and his son do the, bike, the, the swim together. They do the biking together. But when they go to the marathon, uh, they separate because his son was much faster than him, and he's got bad knees. So he was like shuffling, walking, shuffling, walking. It took him six hours just to do the 26 miles of the marathon. So he gets within sight of the finish line. He's 13 hours, 13 and a half hours into this race. He's exhausted. He can barely walk, but he can see the finish line. So he's just straining for that finish line. And he, and he hears a sound behind him. Somebody is, is coming up behind him. Somebody's catching him. And he steals a glance over, and it's that guy, the 77-year-old man <laughs> from the night before. And this means the whole race, he's been catching up to my brother. And he said, he took one look at him. They made eye contact. And my brother said, something snapped inside him. And he went, not today, buddy. And he just sprinted. <laughs> Found a way to sprint at the end. He beat the guy, and he waited for him. They hugged and all that. The guy said, yeah, I know. People react that way when I'm catching up to him. <laughs> but I think that's kind of what Paul's talking about here. The old is gone. You've been made new. So press on. Press on. You bow with me as we close. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that no matter what we see happening around us in the world, no matter what we see when we look back at our lives, no matter what might be ahead that we can't see, your promises are the same. You promise us a new heart, new identity, new purpose, a new destiny. So as we head into a new year as individuals, as a church, remind us, of these truths. Strengthen us by your spirit to be more of what you've already made us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name.